Today we continue our study in a biblical interpretation and today we're in a two-part final uh, study series and we're dealing today with a paradox. Now a paradox is not two doctors in one office uh, or two dachshunds uh, tied together, wiener dogs tied together. Uh, a paradox is something that has two ideas that seem to be completely different but present one truth. And uh, people have had great difficulty in dealing with paradoxes in, in life and in, in Bible situations. And so uh, we feel compelled because of the importance of this particular paradox to deal with it in our study of biblical interpretation because I think if you do not deal with it you will not get the meaning of many scriptures and if you uh, do deal with it and you deal with it incorrectly then that will cause you to have a, a improper emphasis and an unbiblical emphasis and it will lead you into error doctrinally and interpretively. And so we think it's so important that especially in areas where it applies, it is, it is like dispensational truth in that it is such an important issue that where it applies, and of course dispensational truth applies almost to every time and every event. Now doc, uh, the, the doctrines of God's sovereignty and human responsibility will not apply to every event, but they cover most of what we think and believe about salvation and about the Christian life and about God's will for the lo our lives. And so I say that unless you have a biblical balanced view of this that, or unless you have an idea of what you believe the scripture teaches that when you come to these passages you're likely to misinterpret them because of an improper evaluation of this particular paradox in Scripture. We want to go to the Lord in prayer, as we always do, and ask His blessing. And then we want to look at this very controversial and perhaps the, among the deepest of all the mysteries of Scripture to fathom. There are some things you just cannot understand because of your limited mind. And there are some things that we can understand up to a point. And the, uh, uh, this uh, certainly is one of them, and we need to understand this as much as we possibly can. Well, let's pray, and then we'll try to get through the material in a proper way. Heavenly Father, help us today to just understand what your Word teaches about this. And we know that we cannot trace your path we have not been your counselor. We cannot understand the processes through which you formulated your plan. Not all of them we can. And Paul tells us that you're so great and wonderful and magnificent that you exceed us in great and, and, and degrees so that uh, we trust you and rely upon you, but we are not equal with you and we do not comprehend all that uh, your power and being and wisdom and knowledge involves. But Lord, you've written in the Word to us, your Word, that we might understand. And so we do search these things today, even though they involve the complexities and the mysteries of your being. We search these things and, and we can learn and know some things that benefit us in knowing your truth. Help us today, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Perhaps the best way to proceed is by defining what we're talking about. We're talking about sovereignty of God and the what is called free will that really ought to be uh, defined as human responsibility. None of us are free to do everything that we want to do. Circumstances and law and a lot of other things keep us from being totally free. But we are certainly responsible for our decisions and that's 
That's the phrase that ought to be used. Now these two ideas operate to, in the same Bible and so they seem to conflict uh, and that's the problem. But we want to define them. And we have defined the sovereignty of God as His complete and final control over all creation, events, and circumstances. He's God. And yes, he did choose to give us responsibility and make us like him in that we could be responsible for our actions, not forced to love him, choose to love him, not forced to sin or not to sin, but choose to do that. And so in his sovereignty, he did choose to make us humanly responsible. But in choosing to make us humanly responsible, that does not limit or do away with his sovereignty. And so that we say that God has a plan in it, and though he does not cause everything, Satan does some things, and God knows what Satan will do. Human beings make choices, and God knows what human beings will do. And he takes all of the events of everything else, and what he intends to finally do, and he knows what could have been that isn't. He knows alternate plans, that, things that could have happened if we had chosen different. But God takes all of his knowledge together and all of the responsibilities that he put on beings and angels and men and circumstance and he works it all together and produces that which he wants. And he controls everything. And the Bible clearly teaches and indicates that. And that's sovereignty. Now human responsibility is the freedom and the responsibility both morally and, and otherwise to make choices and to bear the consequences of those choices. That's human responsibility. I can wear the color of tie I want to, with the color of shirt I want to, with the color of pants that I want to. If they're all clean and in the closet, I make decisions about that. We make decisions about everything in life, so many. You know, whether to drink our drink through a straw or to drink it without one. We make a decision on that. And some things don't matter in, in the, the importance of life, and some things have great consequences to them. You know, if you're thinking about getting married, you need to seriously and carefully and prayerfully consider that decision. And, and it may be the best thing for you. But you need to seriously consider it decisions that have great consequences in your life. Because we do have human responsibility. But the question is, after we've defined these things, and the problem is... As we look at these things, the problem is, how can God be in control and cause everything and produce everything ultimately by His plan? And we still be responsible for the decision. If God does it, why are we responsible for it? And if, if we are responsible for it, how can, you know, it, it works both ways. If we are responsible for it, how can God be sovereign? And there's the problem. And these, if you, it's like looking down a railroad track where you're standing, you see that the rails are so far apart. But if you look way down the line, friend, long enough, it looks like they have to come together down to a point down there. And and where we err, where we mistake in this this matter of dealing with the problem. You see, it's a paradox. They seem to contradict each other, but there is a blending of the two that produces one truth. <clears throat> and the problem is the conflict. Okay, if, if we come to this issue and we do not resolve the issue correctly, and we'll discuss that in the next series of discussions, the last and final one, if we come to the scripture and we do not resolve this issue, then we're going, to, we're going to be imbalanced or we're going to be confused or we're going to be unsure in our interpretation of things. And if 
we do is we usually do pick one side or the other and emphasize it improperly, we're going to go into error. And we've seen this historically. Because of the emphasis upon sovereignty by men like Calvin, one of the reformers, who emphasized this greatly in his ministry. Because of that, there has been the reaction to that of people who did not agree with him. And that is called Arminianism. And the era of Arminianism that reacted against the sovereignty of, uh, of Calvinism is, and the era in Arminianism that it ended up in people believing that they're either saved or kept saved by the, their works, which the scripture teaches is not so. That because we're humanly responsible, and that's really the controlling factor in, in what happens in our lives and on this earth, that, that it really depends on us and not on the sovereign plan and working and salvation of God. And so you see how you go into error if you emphasize uh, Arminianism improperly in, in, in the view of Scripture. And there is hyper-Calvinism on the other side. If you emphasize sovereignty to such an extent that you eliminate human responsibility, you end up in fatalism for it. If you say that, that people are, are arbitrarily chosen to either go to hell or to heaven, not on the basis of, of believing or, or anything else, but God just says, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell, then you have fatalism. And if you, if you emphasize sovereignty improperly, and I, I am a great preacher of the sovereignty of God. But you can so emphasize it, if God does everything and we cannot do anything, then why, why would you preach the gospel to the lost? You see, and evangel. though I have, I have known people that were what we call five-point Calvinism, and we're going to talk about two that's behind me in just a minute and what Calvinism involves. But I have known people that were very, very strong Calvinists. I'm a modified Calvinist, but were complete five-point Calvinists, very strong, that were evangelistic, just two or three. Charles Spurgeon was one of them. Uh, I, and, and I have heard a couple more that, that, that I did not agree with in their points of emphasis in, in uh, Calvinism, but they maintained a preaching of whosoever will in the gospel. They preached the gospel and invited men to come and to Christ and be saved. Now that's a rare thing in Calvinism because it tends to be if God does everything, we can't do anything anyway. And so in, in like uh, what we call primitive or hard shell Baptists, they, they believe you can't even know you're saved. It's, it's so mysterious. And God's sovereignty is so great, you can't even know that you're saved while you're on here on this earth. You just hope you are. You think you might be, and you hope you are. Uh, you're just so unworthy, you can't ever be sure that, that God has really saved you. And so, hyper-Calvinism leads into fatalism, a lack of human responsibility, and, and very little evangelism or no evangelism in the life. Now we want to talk about this thing of TULIP in the time that we have left. And we want to talk about what sovereignty and Calvinism involves. And Calvin just organized in this, these phrases the discussion around the sovereignty and human responsibility that's in the scripture. We have T, the first letter in TULIP, and that represents the doctrine of total depravity. Total depravity. And next time we're going to discuss the biblical view of these. But of course the Bible does teach that man is dead and trespasses and sin. He's spiritually dead. He's, he can't be saved by his efforts. He can't know God. He can't talk to God. He can't communicate God, to God. He's lost. He needs to be saved before he can do anything. Spiritually live the Christian life. That's true. Man is totally depraved, but what does that mean? And we'll talk about how that affects human responsibility and sovereignty. And then we have 
the you in TULA, unconditional election. Ephesians, uh, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1. That passage about election, that it's not because of anything that we can do or for God or be or have intrinsically that causes God to save us, and that's true, it's by His mercy and His grace. And so we look at this matter of God's choice in who will be saved in unconditional election. L is for limited atonement. And there is this discussion about who Christ died for. And the, the hyper-Calvinists say, would he die for men that he knew would never be saved? Why would he pay the price for men that could not possibly be saved? And they say he didn't. That he just died for the world of the elect, for all that would be saved. He just paid the price for the sin of those that would be saved. And we'll discuss that idea in view of human responsibility and the scriptures when we get into the solution to the problem. And then we have the I, the irresistible grace in sovereignty. That if God does the saving, and he does, what part does man have in that? Can he resist the Holy Spirit? Is God's call, is God's dealing with the heart about being saved, is that irresistible? And if man can uh, put it off, can he finally reject it? And how can God, uh, if he chooses beforehand those that will be in Christ, you know, how can they refuse it? And if, he, if they can refuse it, how can he elect them? And we'll, we'll discuss that. And then we get into the matter of perseverance or preservation of the saints. And there is a difference. I guess the, uh, the old time period had taught more of the perseverance of the saint. That the Christian or the saved person, he might sin and stumble and fall. But he's always going to get up again. He's going to keep on. He's never going to fall away for any long period of time. God is going to continue that work in he begun in him to the end, and he's going to keep going, he's going to persevere. And of course, we have modified that a little bit with a word that indicates something of that, but a little bit different, the preservation of the saints, that is, that, that we believe that eternal security is true, that they will never be lost. And of course, the Bible does teach that. It, it, it teaches some of both, really. But uh, we, it certainly teaches eternal security that, that our salvation is preserved because it's completely the, by faith through the, the grace and the, involves the work of Christ and it is based on a relationship and a life that is given us eternal and God promises never to take it back again in His Word. And so we have this issue of the perseverance of the saints. And in each of these doctrines, in each of these ideas, you have a conflict between is does God do it all? Is God a sovereign says he's in control. Does God do it all? And human responsibility says man makes choices and he must answer to the choices that he makes and their consequences of that. Well, which is true. And there's the problem, you see. And there's the difficulty. And next time we're going to look at the solution to these things. We're going to try to discuss uh, the issues of sovereignty and human responsibility. And we're going to try to look at the biblical view point next time in our discussion. But again, the definition. And it is a paradox. And you need to realize this. And when you have a paradox, you need to carefully consider what the scripture says about both and to get the viewpoint of the total teaching and not just the viewpoint of one or the other. This is what men usually do because of their propensities and their personalities they choose one or the other and this is where the problem is because we're going to hit at the solution now. God's word teaches both of these 
without conflict. Now we don't understand and we won't ever be able to fully understand how there is no conflict. That both can be true at the same time. And the only way that two opposite ideas can be true at the same time is if the Bible says that they are. Now I've used this in many a discussion about things and I think it's true. I've used it in the discussion of the local church. That we are, I believe that the local church is the only organization and organism that God has ordained to do public ministry. But we today have brought in outside groups to do the work of the church and I believe it is more the responsibility of the local church. And you can't have something that's exclusive and inclusive at the same time. In other words, a thing cannot be an apple and not an apple at the same time, logically. The only way that that can be is if God says that they are. And in this matter of human responsibility and sovereignty, God says that both are true. And it isn't our job or our business or our ministry to understand how they both are true. It is our responsibility to believe what God has said about both of them being true. And here is where we get into the problem in many things. We want to we dictate, we want to understand why God is, why God tells us to do something instead of focusing on doing what He tells us to do. And so the solution lies in believing the truth that God has presented and leaving up to God how He can take a plan about everything in which He is sovereign and work all the human responsibilities and decisions and actions of both angels, good and bad, Satan, evil and holy, and men, saved and unsaved, how He can take all those things together with the circumstances of time and the forces of life and put all those together and still be sovereign. But we'll look at the explanation in the next study. And I hope this will be a profit to you today. Amen.